My name is uh, Pio D'Emilia. I'm the Professional Activities uh, uh, Committee co-chair, and I'm moderating uh, today this event. I don't think uh, we need uh, to introduce uh, neither the situation, neither the, our guest speaker. He came here maybe a month ago, exactly a month ago, along uh, again with the Ukrainian colleague. And at uh, the time, uh, the situation was uh, still, uh, so to say, under construction, under diplomatic uh, efforts. Now the situation has exploded somehow. So we are very pleased to have him again and to have him explaining the position of Russia on this um, uh, situation. Uh, so uh, we will start with his uh, introduction, and then, as usually, we will start Q&A from the floor and from online uh, colleagues who are following in online. Thank you very much. Please check again uh, your uh, <coughs> mobiles, put it in silent uh, or turn it off. Thank you very much. Ambassador, it's your turn. Uh, good afternoon, dear Pio. Good afternoon, dear members of uh, the FCCG. It is a great honor for me to speak here today, exactly as Pio have just mentioned, the second second time within a month. Uh, and I'm very grateful to, grateful to you for your interest, for your readiness to uh, listen to uh, our position our arguments with regard to the current situation. Uh, yesterday, uh, Russia, in accordance with the decision of President Vladimir Putin, launched a special military operation. Uh, and the main purpose of this uh, operation is to uh, protect people of Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics who for 80 years have been facing humi humiliation and genocide perpetrated by the Kiev regime. By the way, uh, this uh, genocide and this humiliation have been completely ignored uh, by the United States, by the NATO member states, by the Western states, uh, who are now trying to sharply criticize Russia. We will seek to demilitarize and denazify uh, Ukraine. It is not by accident that I have, regretfully I have to mention this word, to denazify uh, Ukraine, because uh, unfortunately uh, uh, the Nazification of uh, this country uh, has gone very far. And it is very demonstrative that uh, every year Ukraine, along with the United States of America, is voting in the UN uh, General Assembly against a resolution deploring glorification of Nazism, a resolution presented by Russia and like-minded sta like, like -minded states. Now in Ukraine, unfortunately, they glorify not the heroes, who liberated uh, Europe from Nazism, uh, but Nazis collaborationists. Well, and uh, we also seek to bring, on, bring to trial those who perpetrated numerous bloody crimes against civilians, including against the citizens of Russia. But it is not our plan to occupy the Ukrainian territory. We are acting also to defend uh, Russia from the threats to our national security, coming from NATO's expansion to the Russian borders and military exploration of, the neighbor, of neighboring Ukraine to gain a military foothold on its territory. The problem is uh, that uh, in territories close to Russia, a hostile anti-Russia was taking shape. More to this, recently the Kyiv regime started hinting at a possibility of obtaining nuclear weapons in cruel violation of the NPT. We act in accordance with the Article 55, 51 of uh, the United Nations Charter with the permission of Russia's Federation Council, the upper house of our parliament, 
and in execution of the treaties uh, of friendship and mutual assistance with Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republic, Republics. <coughs> I'd like to, uh, at the same time, I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that within all these recent decades, Russia has been trying to settle all the problems by political and diplomatic means. We reminded our counterparts on the necessity uh, to observe the principle of indivisibility of security endorsed uh, in the OSCE uh, on the top uh, level back in 1999 in Istanbul Declaration, Istanbul Charter for European Security. Uh, this principle, uh, the principle uh, of the indivisibility of security, stipulates that no country should ensure its security at the expense of security of other states. Again, uh, this principle was confirmed on the top level within the OECE with the participation of all the NATO member states, Russia, Ukraine, etc., uh, We presented to the United States and uh, the NATO several fundamental proposals on uh, ensuring European security, uh, on uh, uh, legally binding guarantees of security in Europe. Regretfully, these proposals were ignored. Our repeated messages to Kyiv and its Western handlers about the need to stop the violence and genocide in, Don in Donbass and to implement the Minsk package of uh, uh, measures have fallen on deaf ears. Because for them, the people of Ukraine and the people of Donetsk and Lugansk are just bargaining cheap. Even after Russia recognized the independence of these republics. The shelling on their soil by the Ukrainian armed forces not only didn't stop, but even intensified. Given these circumstances, a decision, a forced decision as President Putin uh, underscored yesterday, was made to conduct a special military operation designed to stop the tragedy in Ukraine, which began after an illegal regime change in Kyiv as a result of a violent coup in February 2014. At the same time, we hope that there is still a chance to return to international law and international commitments. As we take measures announced by the president to, president to ensure the security uh, of our country and of the Russian people, we will always, always be ready to, for dialogue uh, that will return us to justice and to the principles of the UN Charter. The basis of our policy is not to damage the interests of Ukrainian people. It is to defend the Russian citizens and our country itself from those who took Ukraine as a hostage and tried to use it against us. Again, no occupation will be conducted. The future of Ukraine shall be decided by the Ukrainian, uh, by the Ukrainian people. Actually, uh, that is all what I wanted uh, to uh, tell you in my opening remarks. So I'm ready for your questions. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador. <clears throat> Allow me to start <coughs> this uh, question and answer and uh, warm up a little bit uh, the debate here. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said, we had the Ukrainian ambassador a couple of hours ago. Mm -hmm. And he insisted uh, very much on a point that I think everybody uh, understood very well, that uh, one thing is to intervene in Donbass mm -hmm. to protect uh, the citizens of uh, the Russian citizens, the Russian people, and another thing is to uh, bomb other part of Ukraine. What is your comment on that? 
As I told you, uh, there are two purposes of uh, uh, sp the special military operation we launched yesterday. First is to uh, protect uh, the uh, citizens of Donetsk and Lugansk uh, People's Republics who have been suffering from uh, uh, apparent and cruel genocide uh, from, uh, by, by conducted by the uh, Kiev regime. Uh, the genocide uh, that was completely ignored, uh, if not endorsed, uh, by uh, the Western countries uh, who were pursuing their own, uh, their own political and military interests uh, with regard uh, to Russia. Uh, the, second, the second part, of the, the second purpose, the second task is to uh, ensure the security interests of Russia. Uh, which have been uh, damaged greatly uh, by the uh, expansion of uh, NATO, of the NATO in military infrastructure and uh, number of the member states of uh, NATO uh, within the recent uh, 30 years. And uh, uh, within the same 30 years, we have made uh, many attempts to uh, settle these issues on a mutually acceptable basis uh, and uh, have uh, uh, presented uh, a lot of initiatives uh, to, to uh, reach this goal. Uh, and at the same time, as one of the co-sponsors co of uh, the Minsk agreements, we were uh, trying actively to persuade uh, the Kiev uh, government to uh, implement, to realize, uh, to carry out the, uh, <clears throat> uh, it, its ob obligations in accordance with the Minsk agreements. Uh, unfortunately, all of these efforts were uh, either rejected or ignored by uh, our counterparts. So, uh, and uh, from that point of view, uh, we, uh, uh, in these circumstances, we uh, launched the yesterday's operation, and uh, well, we are doing uh, things uh, in a military area, uh, things we find necessary to reach the goals of the operation. Uh, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that uh, unlike uh, the uh, Ukrainian government armed forces uh, in uh, Donetsk and Lugansk uh, republics, or we do not uh, conduct any uh, military actions, any bombard bombardments, etc., against the uh, Ukrainian uh, cities. <coughs> uh, so uh, the uh, operation does not direct it against the Ukrainian people. Uh, we work only on uh, on uh, military facilities of uh, Ukrainian army and uh, nationalist, nationalist uh, units uh, 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 deployed uh, in the eastern part of Ukraine. And then again, I would like to remind you that it was the Ukrainian government forces who used military, who used air force, who used heavy armaments against uh, their own citizens Again, the Ukrainian citizens in the east, eastern part of Ukraine, the citizens who did not accept and had all rights to, uh, to not accept uh, the legal regime change in Kyiv in February 2014. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's start from uh, the floor now. Khaldun has the first, then Andy. <clears throat> Thank you, Ambassador, for coming again. Khadun Azhari, Panorit oh, News. Nice uh, my question is, how do you evaluate the relations between Russia and Japan at this stage mm -hmm. after Tokyo imposed more sanctions on your country and people? Mm -hmm. And where is the uh, islands issue uh, is now? We thought uh, you will return the islands, but now it's, it's kind of a dream for Japanese. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Uh, well, of course, um, uh, we uh, 
uh, read today's uh, announcement by the Japanese government about uh, what it called additional sanctions against uh, Russia. Uh, and uh, I recently I have clearly uh, clearly told to the uh, Japanese government, top level government official, that officials uh, that um, first of all uh, these uh, actions from the Japanese side uh, will be responded. There will be a response from us. I suppose there will be a serious response for us from us. And uh, I, I, I'm confident that uh, taking such steps, the, the Japanese government uh, does not contribute to the development of mutually beneficial and friendly relations between our countries. Uh, does not contribute to building up uh, a positive atmosphere um, around our dialogue on a uh, very, very broad agenda we have uh, together, including uh, the uh, peace treaty issue. And uh, I also uh, deeply regret that the Japanese government uh, is uh, taking counterproductive measures towards Russia and the uh, Russia-Japanese uh, relations under uh, b uh, basing on uh, really uh, ba uh, baseless uh, pretexts of uh, they, they, they put as an explanation uh, for uh, these kind of sanctions. Thank you. Andy. Hi, this is Andy Sharp from Nikkei Asia. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming, Ambassador. I do appreciate you taking the time. Mm -hmm. um, just a very short question. Obviously, you talk about defending the ethnic Russian people in the east of the country and the uh, Russian language speakers. But, you know, reports I've seen overnight and mentioned by the Ukrainian ambassador this morning said that Russian forces have seized the Chernobyl power plant. Mm -hmm. um, can you confirm this? And if you have done, please can you explain the rationale behind that? Thank you. Uh, yes, I. Uh, oh, thank you, Andy. First of all, uh, yes, I saw I saw information in the media uh, saying that uh, the uh, Ukrainian side uh, announced that uh, the Chernobyl. Uh, Chernobyl uh, nuclear power plant was taken by the Russian forces. I, uh, at the moment, I cannot uh, deny or confirm this information because I have not seen yet any official uh, announcement from the Russian side uh, with regard uh, to this case. Uh, but uh, I uh, can assure you uh, that uh, everything uh, will be done for uh, safe uh, and uh, responsible handling uh, of all the uh, nuclear facilities uh, uh, that uh, can be uh, that, 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 that can be uh, or may be in the area of uh, the uh, activity of the Russian forces. Uh, I think Greg was first, and then Peter. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Ambassador, mm -hmm. um, you mentioned the importance of the Minsk agreements. Mm -hmm. The Minsk agreements call for autonomy in Donetsk and Lugansk, presumably for the, the oblasts, you know, for the whole area. Mm -hmm. you have a, your government has established republics mm -hmm. in the area which 
should remain autonomous mm -hmm. under the Minsk agreements. Mm -hmm. Can you uh, resolve this contradiction for me? Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, dear Gregory. Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, for seven, within the seven years that Russia is a co-sponsor of uh, the Minsk agreements, uh, was trying, uh, tr trying to persuade uh, the Kiev government to uh, implement the, all the articles of the agreements. Uh, within the same seven years, uh, the uh, Ukrainian government was refusing to do so. And unfortunately, uh, other co-sponsors, namely France, France and Germany, uh, also failed to persuade the Kiev government to implement uh, these agreements. Uh, more to this, uh, in cruel violation of uh, the Minsk agreements, uh, the uh, Kiev government uh, uh, deployed huge troops and heavy weaponry on the contract line. And finally, again, in cruel violation of the Minsk agreement in the end of last week, uh, started, uh, started uh, an, a, a, a large-scale attack on the positions uh, of the uh, two republics. And actually, uh, uh, that is uh, when we uh, realized uh, that uh, the Kyiv regime is not only, does not only want to implement Minsk agreements, but uh, we realized that it wants to uh, make a third attempt to settle uh, uh, the problem by force, following two uh, attempts back in 2014 and 15 uh, that were a complete failure, and uh, after which uh, Minsk agreements were signed. Uh, and also, Kyiv government uh, didn't implement, in fact, many of the articles, if not all the articles, of this agreement. First of all, the Kyiv government refused to establish dialogue with the, uh, what was in the, called in the Minsk agreements as a, a particular districts of uh, Lugansk and Donetsk uh, regions. Uh, there was no amnesty, there was no exchange of prison, prisoners of war, uh, there was no uh, elections under the control of the OEC, etc. So uh, it was the Kyiv government's uh, policy uh, that in fact killed the Minsk agreements. Uh, and uh, this created uh, a completely new situation. A new situation uh, when uh, the two regions uh, asked uh, Russia to recognize them as independent states and uh, taking into account the uh, seven years of sabotage of these uh, agreements by Kyiv authorities and uh, taking into account seven years of genocide conducted by the Kyiv authorities against the uh, population of Donetsk and Lugansk republics, uh, a decision was made in Moscow to recognize them, them as independent states. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, it's Peter Langen at the South China Morning Post. <clears throat> uh, President Putin is, as you indicated already at the press conference, uh, has said that there was a fear that Ukraine was trying to develop a nuclear deterrent, nuclear weapon. Um, but Ukraine, at the collapse of the Soviet Union, gave up its nuclear weapons in an mm -hmm. agreement 
with Washington and Moscow to um, return, uh, well, in return for the safety of its borders or security of its borders. Mm -hmm. So can you provide us with any kind of evidence mm -hmm. that Russia has that there has been an attempt to procure or develop nuclear weapons within Ukraine? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the problems related to the nuclear weapons are too serious uh, and uh, that is why we uh, pay attention, we have to pay attention as a responsible nuclear power state. Uh, we have to pay attention to any signal nuances, nuance uh, even in the rhetoric of uh, the uh, foreign countries regarding the uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, as you well know, uh, from the Kyiv side, on the uh, official level, uh, the hints were made, the statements were made, uh, in favor of uh, obtaining uh, nuclear weapons. And this is uh, a very, very dangerous and clear indication uh, of uh, the intentions of the current uh, regime in Kyiv. Uh, that is what we uh, could not ignore as a responsible member of the NPT and uh, as a nuclear power. Thank you. <clears throat> I think uh, Sergei was there and then uh, Karin. <clears throat> uh, Sergei Mingajev, uh, Russian State Television. Mm -hmm. Speaking about Japanese uh, sanctions, <clears throat> when eight years ago, uh, when Japan joined to, to the West, uh, many people said that uh, Japanese sanctions were soft, m more like nominal. Uh, is it different today? How, how is it different today? And can you give us some details? What, what is the Japanese contribution in to weakening Russian, Russia's economy? For example, um, Russia is banned to um, sell its sovereign debt. So how much, how much is it? How, uh, how much of this sovereign debt was have been, uh, has been sold to Japanese countries or this uh, freezing of assets of in financial institutions and mm -hmm. individuals. Who are those inst uh, individuals? How much is it? How tens, hundreds of millions, mm -hmm. billions? Or, and you said that Russia is preparing response and mm -hmm. you said it will be very serious. Can you share some details? <laughs> what kind of response might it be? Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sergey. Uh, well, uh, at the moment, I only heard the, the official statement from the Japanese government, uh, which uh, says about the key elements of uh, what it calls sanctions against Russia. Uh, they uh, gave no details. Uh, so uh, I don't know about these uh, details, and that is why... I apologize, but I cannot uh, respond in detail uh, to a question about how many, uh, about how much of damage there will be uh, for Russia. Uh, but uh, I definitely know that there will be damage for both sides, for those who impose sanctions and for those who are imposed uh, sanctions. That is one point, and uh, so it is mutually unbeneficial step. And uh, uh, frankly, I wonder uh, why uh, the uh, G7 uh, governments are so uh, so so responsive to the U.S. Uh, demands. Uh, uh, frankly, uh, I hope I hoped to see more independent and autonom autonomous policy uh, from these countries. Uh, then, uh, because uh, the the purpose uh, set by the United States with regard to the sanctions against Russia is actually not related to Ukraine or uh, to any other concrete international issue. It is related to the U.S. strategy uh, to weaken Russia, as President Biden has just 
uh, said uh, while announcing sanctions or before announcing sanctions, the current package of sanctions. Uh, so uh, the, this goal itself is quite toxic and unachievable because uh, it is not uh, possible to uh, host Russia, to exclude Russia from the world economy. And uh, that uh, is what Mr. Biden and his administration aim, uh, uh, try to aim at, try to seek for, and uh, uh, this, is, this cannot be characterized as a responsible approach to the world economy, especially in the days, in current period, when uh, we should unite our economic potentials and our economic competences. Uh, to uh, uh, to struggle uh, the uh, economic decline caused by COVID-19 disease infection. Uh, so uh, the aim of the United States, uh, which was regretfully uh, supported by other uh, members of uh, so-called G7 mechanism, is very, very much counterproductive for the world economy, uh, taking into account the role and uh, place of Russia in uh, world economic mechanisms. Uh, first of all, as a responsible supplier of uh, uh, vitally important energy resources. By the way, vitally important also for Ukraine. Uh, and. Uh, of course, Russia will respond, uh, but uh, the, how it will respond, I cannot, of course, elaborate at the moment. Uh, but I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that uh, Russia, for the recent 40 years maybe, uh, have uh, clearly proven that it is a reliable and responsible exporter of uh, uh, energy resources that are vitally important uh, for the European economy, economies for the Japan's eco for the, for Japan's economy, uh, for Ukraine for Ukraine for Ukrainian economy, uh, and we have proven it, despite the fact that during, uh, especially the recent years. We have been, for many times, a subject for illegal, uh, baseless, and uh, uh, really absurd sanctions uh, from the West. Uh, so, uh, unlike Ukraine, who would steal our gas <laughs> designed for the Western European consumers from the pipelines which is going through its territory, uh, we uh, have always been uh, strictly adhered to our uh, international obligations. <coughs> uh, that is just to, uh, to, to describe our position with regard to the world economy in general and with regard to Mr. Biden's uh, wish to weaken uh, Russian economy. And what kind of sanctions, what kind of response we will we will make, well, uh, uh, in proper time, there will be proper announcements uh, about this, I think. Thank you. Ambassador, since we are talking about uh, economic impact and sanctions, let me jump uh, to the online questions. There are two questions that are mm -hmm. related to this subject. I know that you already kind of answered, but mm -hmm. it's my role to, mm -hmm. to forward the questions. Good. So th the, the first one is from... Uh, <clears throat> Anthony Rowley, also from South China Morning Post, uh, financial sanctions against Russia do not appear to be very severe, at least up to now. Mm -hmm. uh, could you comment a little bit more about mm -hmm. this? And the second one is uh, related to the other, Motoko Rich from New York Times. What kind of serious response might R Russia take against Japan? for imposing mm -hmm. sanctions? Mm. Well, first of all about 
uh, uh, first uh, question uh, uh, from the South China Morning Post post uh, about the severe Weakness. or not that severe nature of the financial sanctions. <clears throat> uh, again, I cannot uh, judge at the moment uh, the, the extent of damage uh, uh, from these kind of sanctions, but I can uh, definitely say that uh, they are uh, mutually unbeneficial, uh, they would be mutually uh, un uh, beneficial if imposed, and uh, uh, that, uh, the, in my view, uh, the problem is not only in the content of uh, this or that sanction. Uh, the problem is uh, that uh, the Western states, headed by the United States of America, uh, they are confident uh, in uh, their exclusiveness, in their superiority, or what they call superiority, uh, in their infallibility to punish, as they say again, to punish those who would not agree uh, with their policy, who would uh, seek uh, their national interests independently, uh, and this is the problem for not only for Russia, or rather than for Russia, uh, this is a problem for the whole international community, uh, because uh, such a boorish behavior as to try to punish by sanctions those who uh, uh, dare pursue uh, independent policy, uh, which would not necessarily coincide with the interests with the West, this kind of uh, behavior, uh, this kind of international behavior is uh, irresponsible and is very uh, dangerous, uh, is uh, very dangerous uh, for the international order uh, based on the uh, UN uh, Charter. That is the problem. Uh, it's not only uh, about what kind of damage uh, Russia will suffer or what kind of damage will suffer those who imposed uh, the sanctions? Thank you. Oh, yes, second question. Yes. Uh, well, uh, I, I can only repeat uh, to the New York Times uh, that uh, in proper time, uh, I think these, our countermeasures uh, are going to be announced. Thank you. Karin? Thank you for coming. My name is Karine Nishimura from a French Liberation newspaper and a Radio France radio station. Uh, my question is, um, what is your final goal in Ukraine? And uh, when you will reach this final goal, will you stop the operation? Or is there any other country uh, you think as a threat for Russia? Thanks. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Karin. I think uh, President Putin was clear enough to, uh, when he uh, explained in his uh, speech uh, on uh, the 24th of February uh, that uh, there are several goals of our operation in Ukraine. Uh, the first is to protect uh, citizens of Lugansk and Donetsk republics who suffered suffered genocide from the Kyiv regime. One more is to uh, defend the security interests of Russia, uh, which were greatly damaged and uh, which are still greatly jeopardized uh, by the uh, expansion of NATO from 16 states uh, back in 1991 to 30 states at the moment, and all new members of uh, the NATO uh, were from Eastern Europe, from what we call post-Soviet republics, and from the Balkan states, namely the uh, countries uh, very, very close to Russia. So now uh, Russia is, uh, uh, the NATO is uh, at our gates, the NATO, uh, which 
first of all, uh, considers Russia as an opponent or, or, or as an enemy, which is, which is very uh, dangerous uh, uh, itself. Then, uh, maybe I have already mentioned this uh, in this hall, uh, then uh, NATO, as maybe no other international organization, has a long, long list of aggressive actions against the sovereign states. Look what uh, the NATO did in former Yugoslavia back in 1999. It was actually a big war in Europe, which led to the uh, change, change of status quo by force. And uh, nobody in the NATO, in, in the uh, European continent at that time, uh, didn't raise uh, their voices against this kind of aggression uh, conducted in apparent violation of international law and the UN Charter and in apparent ignorance, ignorance of the role of the United Nations Security Council. And this aggression led to the division of Yugoslavia and illegal proclamation of so-called independent independence of so-called uh, independent state Kosovo. More to this, back in, uh, if, we, if we enter the 21st century, they were such cruel and uh, destructive aggressions uh, conducted by the United States and their NATO allies, like in Iraq, like in Libya, like now in Syria where the NATO troops are deployed without any permission from the United Nations Security Council or from the legitimate government of Syria. And all these aggressions resulted in very, very negative, very, very heavy results for the region, for the respective regions and uh, for the international community in general. Look what, hap look what happened in Iraq. Uh, so, uh, uh, our goal is to protect our security interests uh, against the background of uh, expansion of such a dangerous organizations, uh, organization as NATO, closely to, so closely to our borders. And again, this organization started uh, military exploration of uh, neighboring Ukraine, uh, yeah. supporting the most radical, uh, the most extremist and neo-Nazi uh, sentiments in the Ukrainian government, Ukrainian state and Ukrainian society. That is what we won't tolerate anymore. So this is our goal, uh, uh, namely demilitarization and denazification of, uh, nazification of uh, Ukraine. Uh, I think it's clear, uh, and uh, uh, as uh, the Russian officials have already announced, uh, the further future of Ukraine will depend on the choice of the Ukrainian people, of people of demilitarized and denazified de Ukraine. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> we have questions. Jimbo. Um, hello, uh, <coughs> Teddy Jimbo with the video news .com. Mm -hmm. um, Just a follow up question on the uh, Minsk um, agreement. Um, the President Putin already said that, that it no longer exists. So, is that a Russia's official position that? that Minsk, uh, Russia is actually abandoning this uh, Minsk agreement. And if that's the case, uh, and since you mentioned the, uh, the preventing expansion of NATO is one of the purpose of the operation, does that mean that the, the ceasefire uh, of the current, current uh, military conflict requires um, uh, Ukrainian government agreeing um, not to join NATO uh, 
for the ceasefire condition. And if um, new, new uh, if Minsk agreement no longer exists, I, I suppose uh, you will need a new agreement. Uh, who will be the uh, involved party? Uh, who do you foresee uh, are the involved party in the new agreement for to establish the ceasefire? Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Harry. Well, first of all, it is not Russia who abandoned, as you said, the Minsk agreements. It is the Ukrainian government who actually uh, abandoned this agreement <laughs> almost immediately after signing it. Uh, and that is uh, the, uh, really a problem, because uh, for seven years we tried uh, without having any productive assistance from other co-sponsors like uh, France and Germany. And we were trying to persuade the Ukrainian government to implement Minsk agreements, but uh, there was no result because due to the very, very much, uh, uh, let's say, uh, unfriendly position uh, of, the, uh, of the Kiev government and uh, uh, and uh, as, as a result of uh, really uh, absence of political will in Kyiv to implement uh, this agreement. So that is not, uh, that, uh, I understand that uh, there is a sort of a fashion uh, to announce anything uh, as a result of uh, Russian uh, actions. But uh, in this case, it's not Russia who killed uh, this agreement. Uh, then um, you asked about the future, I mean, about the future developments with regard to the special military operation in Ukraine. Well, uh, it, uh, it, it does not depend only on us, uh, what is going to happen next. Uh, we, of course, uh, we would prefer to see uh, responsible uh, attitude towards our initiatives, towards our proposals, towards our ideas, which we have presented during uh, recent uh, decades uh, for many times, but unfortunately we haven't yet seen uh, such uh, a responsible uh, agreement. We have seen only uh, only uh, NATO expansion and uh, empty chats, empty talks uh, about uh, regional security with no result. So, uh, and uh, uh, we have not seen yet the, the uh, true observance of the principle of uh, in the indivisibility of security, which I mentioned above. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Maybe there, yes. <clears throat> Hi, thank you, Ambassador. My name is Haruyo Miyamoto from Tokyo Broadcasting System. Mm -hmm. Thank you. My question is um, regarding um, your special operation mm -hmm. that's undergoing in Ukraine right now. Mm -hmm. um, you say that's a special operation to mm -hmm. demilitarize and mm -hmm. to liberate the people of Ukraine from the Nazis. That's the explanation, basically, I understand. Mm -hmm. But um, if Russia succeeds in this operation, mm -hmm. if it succeeds in liberating Ukraine, do you think the people in Ukraine, not only in the Donbas area, but in Kyiv and in western part of Ukraine, do you think the people in Ukraine will accept your government's decision and will be, will be welcoming President Putin's decision? What do you think? Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Uh, Miyamoto. Uh, we, uh, we declared very clearly that uh, our goals are to protect people in Lugansk and Donetsk uh, republics, then uh, to protect our national security interests, and uh, to demilitarize and to denazify uh, uh, Ukraine. After that, after that, uh, the uh, decision will be made not, not by us. It will be made by the Ukrainian people. And I don't, at, at the moment, I cannot predict what kind of decision uh, will be made uh, by the Ukrainian people. But what, uh, as President also mentioned in his 
speech on the uh, 24th of February. What, uh, we, mm, uh, what we think is uh, that uh, the will of the Ukrainian people uh, may be uh, expressed after our operation in a more, uh, in a freer, freer atmosphere, uh, not uh, in an atmosphere of orchestrated and decorated uh, so-called elections uh, that have taken place uh, that have taken place in Ukraine recently, under the huge pressure from the rightist movements, under the huge pressures uh, from nationalist, uh, illegal nationalist armed groups, uh, and uh, from the uh, from those unfortunately very strong forces in Ukraine, in current Ukraine. Uh, that uh, glorify Nazi collaborationists as heroes. So we hope that uh, after our operation, uh, the Ukrainian people will have a chance for really free expression of its will. Thank you. Ambassador, I have uh, <clears throat> two questions online from uh, Ilgin Yormatz, BBC World Turkish. Mm -hmm. Let me ask them one by one because they are totally unrelated. The first one is, <clears throat> Ukraine has requested Turkey to consider to invoke the article in 1936 Montreux Conference that allows Turkey to ban passage of military ships mm -hmm. through the Bosphorus Strait. Mm -hmm. Soviet Union was a signatory at that time. Mm -hmm. was it, what is Russia's point of view on this Ukrainian request? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I uh, haven't seen our official re reaction on the very on this particular particular uh, information of uh, the media about the well, your, your U reaction. Ukrainian request. But my reaction is that uh, Russia, as a state that continues uh, the international obligation uh, obligations of the Soviet Union legally. Uh, this uh, Russia, of course, uh, as a, a party of uh, the Montreux Convention, of course, uh, Russia uh, proceeds from the point that Pacto Sunt Servanda and uh, the, the uh, international uh, obligation to, uh, obligations, international agreements uh, should be kept, should be implemented fully. Thank you. Thank you. Now, the second question is a more general one. Uh, what kind of legacy mm -hmm. does your President Putin want to leave behind him when he will retire one day? Someone who stopped the NATO at its borders and revived somehow former Soviet Union, or someone who started a new war in Europe after the end of World War II? Well, uh, I will... Uh, you should ask Putin, of course. But. Uh, yes, of course. <laughs> well, that's what I wanted to say in, in, in final part of my question, of my answer. <laughs> Thank you so much, Pio, for <laughs> anticipating correctly. <laughs> uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to uh, just express my opinion that uh, a new war in Europe uh, was started not by Russia now, uh, uh, Russia is not waging a war in Ukraine. It is milit special military operation, let's be correct. Uh, the war in Europe wa was uh, started, uh, was waged uh, by the above-mentioned NATO back in 1999 when uh, NATO uh, conducted uh, an, unprovoked and milit uh, an unprovoked military aggression against a sovereign state, a member of the uh, United Nation, na Nations, in cruel violation of the UN Charter and without having any permission from the UN Security Council, uh, which is uh, a body uh, exclusively responsible for international peace and security in accordance with the UN Charter. So it's not Russia who started the war. Uh, then, uh, uh, you ask me about legacy uh, of my president. Uh, I would like you 
just to objectively assess uh, what has been done in uh, Russia, both with regard to its domestic and economic policy and foreign policy, uh, during the period when President Putin, when, when Vladimir Putin was either president or the uh, or prime minister of uh, Russia, uh, there was a great progress in any in in many areas, and there was a great strengthening of Russian position in international affairs as uh, a very responsible uh, power uh, which contributes greatly to world peace and security. And uh, I uh, just uh, taking into account that Pio has already <laughs> said very, very, uh, very valuable words, uh, I would like just to, uh, to say uh, that uh, uh, President Putin's mission uh, has not completed yet. He's continuing fulfilling his duty as uh, the President of Russia, as Commander-in-Chief of Russian Armed Forces, as uh, the leader of our nation, and of course, uh, uh, we, I, I, and I'm sure that there will be new and new uh, success uh, under the leadership of President Putin. Thank you. Well, uh, I know that your president is very active on Zoom, so maybe you can help us to have him on Zoom and ask, answering this question <laughs> at the next uh, occasion. <laughs> Let's try, why not? <laughs> okay, um, I think that we are wrapping up now. It's uh, time, is, uh, let, allow me, as usually, the last question. Uh, I think that most of us, including you and me, uh, mm -hmm. been born under a bipolar system mm -hmm. coming after the World War. And then we witnessed uh, the, a period of uh, unipolar system, the American being the only superpower. Do you think that uh, this era is over forever, that American, so-called American order is finished, and now we have at least uh, a tripolar situation, China, Russia, and America? Well, uh, we, in Russia, we in Russia think uh, that we are now all, whether, uh, whether anybody likes it or not, uh, we are living in a multipolar world. Uh, yes, there was a period uh, when uh, uh, the West, headed by the United States, uh, might feel its uh, exclusiveness and its exclusive right uh, to uh, uh, so-called right, alleged right, uh, to decide uh, uh, about uh, the international order. How uh, should it be? Uh, but uh, this time has already passed because new centers of uh, political, economic, and military power are emerging. And uh, uh, this is what should be taken into account by the United States and its Western allies, that the world uh, has changed and changed dramatically. Uh, and uh, there will be no situation, in my view, in foreseeable future, uh, that the United States uh, could unilaterally decide uh, may, could unilaterally made, make decision uh, on this or that uh, problem, uh, on uh, this, this or that issue. There should be a collective in, in, in present day world when we all face uh, the problems that can, cannot be handled, that cannot be solved uh, by uh, one single country, no matter how powerful is it, how powerful it is, uh, we should uh, more and more rely on collective mechanisms of uh, settling international issues. And, of course, the most universal and the most 
the most uh, responsible, the most authorized, is the, the United, uh, United Nations. But at the same time, uh, we see the uh, apparent growth of uh, role uh, and effectiveness of uh, G20 mechanism, where the all main countries uh, are represented, including uh, BRICS state, states, for instance, <coughs> including above mentioned uh, G7 and other largest economies of the world. Uh, so, uh, f uh, in our view, uh, there will be no place for uh, this kind of aggressive unilateral approach exercised uh, by the United States, which the United States and uh, the NATO uh, try to exercise even now, even now, even these days. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very, very much, everybody. You have now a break of a couple of hours. I hope to see you all here again for uh, the last third of the day. The American Ambassador Emmanuel Ram is uh, coming. So thank you very much, Ambassador, thank you, Peter. Thank you. for coming again. I hope to welcome you and your Canadian uh, guest again at the end of this. Very soon, I hope. Thank you.